because it was five years ago today that Jonestown happened, the mass suicide of 912 people in the South American jungle of Guyana that shocked the world. The dead were followers of a religious fanatic named Jim Jones. He ordered them to drink poison Kool-Aid, and they did. The suicide order followed a visit to Jones' commune-style camp called Jonestown by Democratic Congressman Leo Ryan and a party of Americans that included several reporters. Ryan and four others were shot and killed as they attempted to fly away from a nearby airstrip. One of those wounded, but who survived, was Charles Krauss, then a reporter for the Washington Post. He later wrote a book about the whole affair, and this week went back to California where it all began. Five years later, Jonestown remains little more than a series of images. Images many people believe should be forgotten. Jonestown is nothing to be forgotten. Uh, there are many cults in the world today and there are many cults in America. I feel that Jonestown is something that could happen again. You know, I feel that people need to be alert and remember Winona Norwood lost her mother and 26 other close relatives in Guyana. She believes the world should have learned from Jonestown, that her family should not have died in vain. I feel that people should have tried to search Jones out and find out before he left and got so very many families and children over to Jonestown how really, you know, evil he was. Hundreds of those who died at Jonestown are buried at the Evergreen Cemetery in Oakland, California. Winona Norwood's family is among them. It's Mrs. Norwood who organizes the annual memorial service here to ensure that Jonestown is not forgotten. She also lectures to church groups. 90 to 95 percent of Jim Jones's church was black, and he promised the black people that were in his church, as well as the Hispanic people and the Oriental people, you know, you're going to go, we have our own community. You will live without racism. He promised them a paradise, a utopia, and they believe that. People have need, a need for faith, you know, in God. And when someone has their program so together as Jones did, to come along and stage fake healings and fake messages such as what he did, calling persons' names out and saying, I'm God, I know your name because I'm God, there are other ministers out there, other so-called ministers, that have their programs together on a smaller scale, that are taking children, that are molesting children, that are, you know, taking families and dividing families apart. Yes, I very strongly believe that Jonestown could happen again. I know that I lost a lot of people over there, but I also know that I fought trying to keep them from going. And I just, I'm not going to let them be forgotten. As a cult or religious organization, the People's Temple died along with Jim Jones in the jungles of Guyana. The temple headquarters in the United States, here on Gary Street in San Francisco, has been sold and is now the Korean Central Presbyterian Church. The millions of dollars which Jones hid in secret bank accounts all over the world have now been recovered and finally dispersed by the courts. But there were survivors, about 250 members of the People's Temple, who were either not in Jonestown or who managed to escape the tragedy five years ago today. Most of them live in the Bay Area. Few, if any, are willing to talk publicly about their experiences. But we're told that they, too, are anxious that Jonestown not be forgotten. And I on America. Tonight, trying to clean up your neighborhood, you could be facing anything from billy clubs to blackmail. And we'll tell you why. I'm not afraid of their intimidation. Hell, I'm, a, I'm 68 years old. I didn't die in World War II. I don't give a damn anymore. This is the CBS Evening News. Good evening, Dan Rather reporting. If it were possible for the standoff in Central Texas to get any more bizarre, 
It did that today. The cult leader who promised to surrender to federal authorities says he is now taking orders from a higher authority. CBS News correspondent Vicki Mabry has the latest from the scene near Waco, Texas. As correspondent Bill Lagatuto reports, the theory is this incident could end in more deaths, just like Jim Jones and his followers. 1978, Jonestown. 900 cult members followed their charismatic leader to their deaths. They too thought he was the Messiah. Winona Norwood, who lost her mother and 26 other relatives to Jim Jones, is worried tonight about Texas. Everybody dies in one day. You'll never forget it. I never forget it. I think about my family every day. The world never forgot Jonestown, but still, by some estimates, 2,500 cults are thriving in America today. The experts say most who join cults are emotionally confused or distraught, and the promise of a utopian life fills the void. Add in a leader providing for their every need, and rational thought can give way to blind obedience. They're being held hostage, some of them against their will, and some of them are brainwashed to a level of where I'll die for the cause. The story of Jonestown should have taught the world to beware of messiahs, of how susceptible people yeah. can be, and of how easily minds can be controlled. Another hard lesson is in the making tonight. Bill Agatuda, CBS News, Los Angeles. Still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News. And Jones and more than 900 of his followers took their own lives. A woman who lost her mother and 26 other family members at Jonestown warns there are similar self-destructive cults now active in this country. So, no, this is not an isolated case. Uh, Jonestown incidents are taking place around this country. And people, uh, I don't think, want to really address it especially if they have a family member in there. Psychologists say typical cult members are those who feel alienated from their families and society at large, disenfranchised. The cults offer the promise of paradise, an idea that a few members find worth dying for. George Lewis, NBC News, Los Angeles. Here in New York City, officials now are offering... This is CNN. Five years after the Jonestown massacre, the memories of the tragedy are still burned into the American psyche. Tonight, exclusive. A survivor of that terrible day breaks her silence. And in his first live national interview, we'll meet the soldier who Jessica Lynch calls her hero. Twenty-five years ago tomorrow, more than 900 people died as part of a mass murder and suicide in a small enclave in South America. Most were followers of a charismatic religious leader named Jim Jones. Among the dead was a U.S. congressman who went to Guyana to look into reports on what was going on. Charles Feldman looks back at the shocking events at Jonestown. Because of Jonestown, drinking the Kool-Aid has become synonymous with blind loyalty. 25 years ago, in the South American nation of Guyana, more than 900 mostly U.S. followers of cult leader Jim Jones were ordered or forced to drink cyanide-laced Kool-Aid punch, turning their dream of heaven on earth into a hell few could have imagined. A U.S. congressman who led a delegation to Jonestown to investigate claims that Jones's followers were being imprisoned and abused was shot dead. Jones himself was discovered later with a bullet in his brain. To this day, no one knows whether it was suicide or murder. As soon as she got out of high school, my aunt sent her to Jonestown. We never ever heard from her again. Winona Norwood, a She's California a pastor, was lucky in a way. Her distrust of Jim Jones prevented her from going to Jonestown. But her family paid an enormous price, nevertheless. 27 people in my family died at Jonestown, including my mother. The youngest person in our family that died was three months old. What could the babies do? The history of the world is filled with those who seek utopia. But no one realized at the time that Jim Jones's sick mind was prepared to annihilate his own followers as a price of admission. Jonestown, of course, did not happen in a cultural vacuum. Few things do. In 1978, the U.S. still was convulsed by the Vietnam War and the swirling currents of peace and civil rights movements. 
The search for alternatives to organized religion was in high gear. Can another Jonestown massacre happen? In a way, it already has. I don't think we have really learned anything from the massacre at Jonestown because the Wacos are still happening. Heaven's Gate is still happening. You know, September 11th is still happening. And yet that event so long ago, that mass act of inhumanity, seems to fit in a category all by itself. Jonestown was a place that was supposed to uplift the soul. Instead, it has brought about a quarter of a century of soul searching. Charles Feldman, CNN, Los Angeles. You know, every one of those people, if they were alive today and they were faced with a man like Jim Jones, they'd say, I'm the hell out of here. So, oh, yeah. things were different then than they are now. You know, right. and they made choices that got them into that situation. Right. And God bless them for it. Right. They were beautiful. They were gorgeous. They were amazing. Right. I loved them dearly. Listen to this what are you saying? Are you saying that the people who, who escaped are willing to forget the, being, being policemen over the people who survived, who, who ran away? It's, it's a tough, it's tough ground to cover. But, uh -huh. but I'm saying that forgiveness is uh -huh. our answer. And to be willing to look back on all of our part. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it was and setting aside the children, of course. But look back on it and be willing to dig in. Hey, this is where I made mistakes. This is where I made mistakes. This is what I would do differently if given. Yeah. But that's a hard call, you know. I mean, I know forgiveness is right. I know forgiveness is right, you know. I know forgiveness is right, but the people were so innocent, you know, and when you say, some of them were. well, some of them, you're right. I take that back. Okay. You're right, you're right, you're right. But when you say, I just yeah. It's, I'm not talking about blaming that. No, no. I mean about about, 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 about his anymore. name being on the on the wall. Right. Well, That's so difficult. You know. You. you know, you're not going to have me up in arms if you don't do it. Okay. I'm talking okay. mainly between you and me and about 700 other cameras and microphones. But I'm talking between right. you and me that forgiveness was my oh, answer. Oh, yeah. How did you do that? How did you get over? Because I don't I, think I've gotten there yet. How, tell me, tell me, give me a step. I went back to his childhood. I started um, writing about how more alike I am mm -hmm. than different from him, mm -hmm. you know, and there became a point where I could no longer, you know, put my problems in his lap. Uh -huh. And that's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's a release. Yeah. It's truly a release. And I stand responsible for my life, knowing that I couldn't have done it any differently mm -hmm. and praying that I will, will do it differently if I give it another opportunity. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Okay. God bless you. I love you, honey. I'll call you. You got my number. And they shot her through the head. Like they did rhyming all the reporters. They shot them and then they walked up on them and shot the brains out. After the initial onslaught, the assassins selected victims from amongst the wounded and executed them. There was a guy behind who was and uh, the congressman blames blow it all over the place. I mean, she spoke more graphic to why I wanted that she did me, really, because I kind of like, uh, I didn't even, I couldn't even imagine my brothers being involved in anything like that. You know, it was like, no, this is not happening. You know, I, it was like a bad script on a TV program or something. You know, it was like. Were they both coming back with her at that time? Yeah, it was, the, see, the original trip was, she went over there, okay? First time she went over, she, uh, that was her and um, my uh, father, and without attorney, just to see uh, my uh, brothers. Um, they still were not allowed, they brought my brothers them to town, okay? Along with members of Jonestown, of course. And my brothers, my mother said she never uh, uh, seen so much fear in my brother's eyes in her whole life. She says, I know my children, and they were seeing uh, how happy my brothers were there, and how the youngest one had just fathered a child, and and my mother was saying, like, yeah, he had to go, before they hit land, he had to be screwing in order to have a baby that quick. You know what I mean? It's just impossible with the time. And that uh, my older, uh, the older Bruce was telling mom, go home, please go home, just go home, please. And that was it. Uh, they were supposed to be allowed to go out to, into the jungle, into Jonestown, actually, the next day. And I guess orders came down that they could not. They hung around for, for a few days uh, 
to no avail, tried to contact people to pay people to take him into Jonestown, nothing. So he left. Second trip was uh, after my mother got the habeas corpus to go back and then, like I said, begging, borrowing, selling stuff to hire attorneys to go with her, the whole route. And that's when she went along on the flight with uh, Senator Ryan, I mean, Congressman Ryan. And so she's with these people, and, and they really were targeting Ryan. I mean, he was shot 45 times. Right, right. How did she then, where, where did she go? How did she? They, I mean, you weren't, you're not talking about no marksmen. I mean, sex experts shooting. They were firing. Mom said bullets are flying all over the place. He might have been the main target. You know, a guy could have hit him with an automatic weapon, right. you know. Uh, there was even talk from my mother that someone on the plane actually shot him too. Now, oh. that was that was on the flight with us. That was speculation. So I mean, it's not. You know, it was kind of like it just. I mean, you can imagine. Uh, it, uh, just everything just broke loose at once. Everything just broke loose at once. She, she, you know, she didn't know she was seeing little kids' brains splattered. She looked for help, and then as congressman brains and looking down at animals. You know, the, the guy is like filthy to me. I mean, a dog's running around eating, you know, the remains, and it was it, it was terrible. It was bad. I believe what happened was he probably told them, you know, things are bad in the United States because this is what he had kept telling us all along, and he told us that the Klan was marching in the United States and black people were being put in concentration camps and anyone who was there in Jonestown was being protected from what was going on in the United States and we should be grateful that we're in this beautiful country in this jungle but now the United States is not happy with just having the black people that are there and being incarcerated they want to come now and get the black people that are in Jonestown so it is important that we show them what we're willing to do for the cause step up I want you to drink of this. We're gonna we're gonna perform another white night. Come on, folks, get up here. And I'm certain they probably just went right along with it because they thought once again this is just a test. He's taking us through this thing to see if we're willing to to give our all to the cause. We all wanted to be a martyr of some kind, so we would do it. So I really believe that the first maybe 50 or 60 people, maybe even the first hundred, went up there and drank it and they probably gave it to their children thinking that oh maybe we'll go to sleep for a little while but when we wake up it'll be all over but suddenly I'm sure when he got down to a hundred people who are just laying down there and nobody's moving I'm sure at some point in time someone probably shook someone and said they're really dead because ultimately many of those bodies had needle punctures and gunshots etc so I don't believe that anyone who was there was suicidal other than Jim Jones. <laughs> anyone else, I think that they really wanted to live. In fact, they had gone to Jonestown to escape the lives that they were, were living here because they weren't happy with the way they were living their lives here. They escaped to go to Jonestown so that they could live forever. He promised us we would live forever. He promised us we would be in a utopia country. He promised us we would have free food, free health care, that we would, we would live in our own individual homes with our family members. And everything he promised us, he reneged on. So when you like when you went to Jonestown, how, what was your living arrangements? I lived in a big wooden dormitory that had no paint on it. They, it was the cheapest wood you could have found. I, I think somebody probably gave them the wood free, but they were telling us they were buying all this lumber, and the beds were like made out of wood, and it was two to three bunks each with no mattress, no blanket, or anything. It was like bring your own bedding. If you didn't bring it with you from the United States, uh, you better hope that you could borrow something from somebody else who was there. Wow. Well, how did people get there? He didn't have like a big plane and people just kind of? Oh, no. He, he, what, you, what he would do is he'd have you get your passport and everything, and then they'd make arrangements to get you an airline ticket. However, the interesting thing there is when my husband and I left for Miami to go on board KLM Airlines to get to Guyana. We only had 
a few suitcases because they told us we were not allowed to carry any more than one suitcase each. So since there were three of us, we had three suitcases. When I got to the customs in Georgetown, I had big crates. And, I, and so when the Guyanese gentleman, the customs asked me, what's declare what's in the crates? And I'm like, what crates? He goes, those crates. I said, that's not my crates. And then Debbie Imes told me to be quiet. And I said, you don't tell me to be quiet. And she says, be quiet. That's stuff that father needs. Because that's what you call Jim Jones' father. And I'm like, what stuff? She goes, just be quiet. We, it's, it's our things. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I had these large, huge crates. I, 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 they were, I guess, probably about this size and about that deep, just huge wooden crates. So they put those inside of this old blue van, and they had uh, us sitting in the back on top of the crates. And I was whispering to my husband. I was saying, what do you think's inside these crates? He goes, I don't know. I said, I'm not feeling this. He goes, I'm not either. So we were just you know, trying to smile and act nice and everything. Soon as we got in the house, give us your passport and all your money. Well, of course, we didn't give them all our money, but what are we going to say when they say give And I said, well, why do we have to give you your passport? Because Father wants you to give it because he doesn't want you to lose it. So my husband being the attorney is, he goes, it's against the law to ask someone for their passport, and it has to stay in our possession. Well, he argued with him, and finally I said, look, stop arguing. Don't make this thing difficult for us. Just give him your passport. So he gave him the passport. Well, I was curious what was in those crates. Guns. What, what kind of guns? Huge guns. Well, see, I wasn't a police officer then, so I don't know what kind of guns they were, but probably if I had to uh, think about it in retrospect, I would say they were probably some semi-automatic type of um, rifles and things that were in there. I've never lied to you. I never have lied to you. I'm the best friend you'll ever have. You'll regret it if you don't die. You don't die. You'll regret it. You're taking a drink that takes you to go to sleep. <laughs> Keep your emotions down. Keep your emotions down. Children, it will not hurt if you'll be, if you'll be quiet, if you'll be quiet. Children, it will not hurt if you'll be quiet. I feel that uh, the lesson that we have learned from this movement is just is several folds. Number one, there was a vo vacuum and a void in this community in 1976 when I came here. When it comes to the social gospel, the church being on the cutting edge, very, very few African American faith leaders had the resource, uh, were exhibiting the know-how to engage a faith community in a holistic ministry that speaks to the individual salvation and to social salvation. Young people were just beginning to discover greatly what drugs were. Uh, senior citizens who came here in the 40s, worked in the shipyards, which as longshoremen were beginning to age. Their children and grandchildren didn't take time with them. So Jim Jones came along providing them an alternative. You know, a family. He even called himself Father. He even went to the, the extreme of calling himself God. And in times of challenge like this, people need something to hold on to. And he promised them a shortcut to paradise. They wanted to get out of this hell hole. The redevelopment agency had come along. Six acres of land where black people used to have theaters, hotels, businesses, restaurants, all up and down the field more. But what happened? When the redevelopment agency came along, when it was discovered that this society, as one book title indicates, did not need the Negro anymore, to do cheap labor, to work in the uh, 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 manufacturing industries. We were moving from a, an industrial 
to a communication information age. However, the school system did not prepare these blacks who had come in from the South for this communication information age. This school system was very much racist. You did not even get blacks teaching in this school system in significant numbers until the 60s. Before that, the only way a black person would get a job teaching in this, school, in this area, in the Bay Area, you had to go to Berkeley or Oakland. Um, so we weren't being prepared for this new wave. But what did they come along with? This thing called urban renewal, but really it was black removal. I remember going to those second class schools. I remember not being able to go into a hotel not being able to try on a pair of shoes in the store. Not being able to use the restrooms facility that you wanted to go to. And I remember very vividly, and it's seared in my mind, I see it in my mind's eye, that picture of Emmett Till in that Jet magazine in 1955. If Emmett Till had lived, not been killed by those evil white men. He would be the same age as I am. I lived through all of that. And his, that, that, that emaciated, halt face in that casket. And his mother said, don't close that casket when they took the body back to Chicago. Let it stay open so the world will see how these evil people treated my baby. Now, I should have every reason wherever I go to just hate white folk because I know how sluggish Jagger Hoover was in investigating it. I know how Trent Lott was, his family, and even his own mother who fought Meredith's going to the University of Mississippi. I know that even Trent Lott is not doing his tenure in the Senate. Ever put his foot in one black church in his district at all. And for him to have said that things would have been better off if uh, Strom Thurmond had been elected president in 1948, he meant every bit of it. All of that is still around us, and yet we can't hate. For when you hate, it, it, it consumes you and your body, and you are destroyed in the process when you think that you are getting back. Your mind about first about those days, about what happened. I think the shock of uh, the uh, fact that a dream became a nightmare that so many people who had uh, had such hopes for change, for opportunity, for uh, freedom, uh, saw those hopes dashed on uh, the reality that uh, there was a, an insecurity, a, a paranoia uh, that led to a tragedy, uh, whether there were survivors or certainly those who were witnessing it from afar. It was something that I think no one had anticipated. How, how did you know Jim Jones? Through his activities in the community. Uh, I'd been involved in politics in the Bay Area since I'd gotten out of law school in the early 70s and certainly saw Jim Jones as someone who really demonstrated a good coming together of religion and community, whether it was the uh, food programs or working with the churches or the political activism. I thought all of those were the kind of things that churches and ministries should do. The fact that he was reaching out to the unwashed, reaching out to the poor, reaching out to those who'd been locked up, to all those who'd been disregarded by mainstream religions, I thought was a very positive thing. And I think those who obviously responded did as well. And, well, sorry, can we sh shift your weight just a little bit left? I, you don't have to lean, and you can cross your legs if that feels comfortable too. But uh, you couldn't argue with the results. People were responding, people were joining, people were excited. Uh, there was the kind of involvement uh, that was demonstrated the best of social activism, uh, things the civil rights movement had done, things that people had seen in terms of uh, the social activism of uh, responding again to social problems. We really saw Jim Jones, if not as a messiah, certainly as a 
uh, an example again of what was right with religion and why people should be uh, part of institutionalized religion. How did people in Oakland hear about him? Through his activities in San Francisco primarily. Um, you know, we certainly saw him on the news. We certainly saw him at political events and community events, uh, at church events. He seemed to be everywhere, and his members were everywhere. They were enthusiastic. Uh, they certainly were the best salespeople for uh, Jim Jones and his uh, and his efforts because they, quite frankly, really believed uh, in what he was doing in a way that uh, was absolute. When you heard that they were going to move to Guyana, mm -hmm. what, what, what did you think? What was your response? Well, I, I thought about people like Marcus Garvey and others who had uh, looked at other alternatives to uh, America in terms of its uh, oppression, uh, its uh, injustices, and who really believed that uh, uh, a land where freedom and equal opportunity and humanity uh, would be the rule rather than the exception. And I think a lot of people saw this as perhaps a, uh, a sociology lesson uh, that could uh, demonstrate that people could come together across racial lines and across other lines and find peace and, and happiness and, su and success. Do you know what the percentage of, like, how many people from Oakland went down there? No, I don't. Uh, I know there was a large number of people from this area as well as from throughout the Bay Area who really believed that uh, this was going to be a, a new land, a new opportunity, and quite frankly were excited about the adventure. Um, did you meet him? What, what was he like? Jim Jones, obviously very charismatic, warm, engaging smile, uh, certainly sold you on his sincerity that he really not only uh, wanted others to be true believers, but that he was as well. He believed in the dream. Uh, he believed in people. He uh, saw their potential. He wanted to help them maximize that potential. And I think people were excited and, and genuinely uh, uh, happy to have someone who believed in them with so many people who, again, were oppressed and so many people who did not believe that there was a sense of opportunity or possibility. That you can, you can make a person more vulnerable through religion? Yes, I think the vulnerability, of course, was some three and a half centuries old at that time. People hungering for status, people hungering for Valhalla, Nirvana, heaven, people hungering for a situation that does not invoke such tension. They are in the church because the black community is in the church. You want to reach black people, you reach them in the church. So he comes out as a shepherd. He sees sheep and some of the black sheep see a shepherd. Some of them were victims of a type of discrimination that would really say, if you're white, you're right. If you're black, get back. Here comes a white shepherd to black sheep. The black sheep, indoctrinated, follow the white shepherd because white is right. And they leave the situation that has been feeding them all along. They leave cornbread, presumably, to go to cake. I had a dear friend who, let's see, I was 20, so she had to be probably 18, um, basically raped her, drugged her and raped her. Yeah. And seeing her the day that I saw her, I just knew it was, we, we, we had gone to hell. It was all hell. Because I looked at her and thought, and she was dating one of the one of the Jones boys, and the father had taken her physically. And then I knew we were in trouble. Then I knew this has gone way. This is this is this is bad. This is really bad. Um, and so I just decided then I had to leave. I didn't know how. I had no clue at that point how, how I was going to get out. But you know, I knew it was going to happen. You know. Did other people? Did you talk to other people about it? No. No, you didn't talk to anybody. I mean, what happened to me was I was blessed enough to meet someone named Diane and her husband Richard. Richard passed last year, Richard Clark. And we were kind of talking, just filling each other out, trying to, you know, what do you think about this? And Diane was very open and just, you know, said what was on her mind, somewhat like myself. So we forged this friendship and we started just feeding each other a little bit of time, you know, the dislikes, and then you kind of see if it's going anywhere. If you didn't end up on the if you didn't end up on Wednesday night on stage with someone reporting you, then you knew that person was okay. So we kind of tested each other for a while. 
finally we just said, you know, hey, I, I want to get out of here. And she said, my husband has been trying to find a way, has been digging a way out for since the time he got here, which had been for six months. And I'm like, well, I want to go. And she goes, okay, well, there's a group of us, and we have to discuss it. Well, I was married to Joe Wilson. So they're thinking she's a plant, you know. And I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm not a plant. I really, I really am not a plant. So basically what happened was they trusted me to take me with me, you know, to take me. And we didn't have a date. But when Congressman Ryan came the night before, they said, we're going to, we're leaving. We were trying to get out that day, and then we said, no. they said, no, we can't go now. So the next day is when we left. But we, you know, we didn't have a clue, you know, that it was going to happen. My intention was to, was to go back and get my mom and my sister and my brother and my, and my um, you know, the rest of my family. Because I felt once I got out, I could tell them, this is, this is really what's happening. You know, and, and they would believe me because I ran for my life and made it. You know, so I was serious, but I think the majority of people wanted to leave. I know they did. I know they did. I just think that they, there was no way out. And so people tried to make the best of it. Did they have any idea that Jim was going to do this? I don't think the average person could even comprehend that kind of evil. I don't think, you know, he, his, his soul was a residence of evil. I don't, I don't, I don't think, the average person doesn't have that in them, that kind of hate and that horrible, he was, he was horrible. So the average person can't even respond to that. You know, it's kind of like, I think we had talk, was talking to someone about putting Jews on the trains right. and them heading out and them, in their minds, did they think they were headed for death? No, they didn't think that. They would have fought. They would have fought. Did you, well, I, I'm sure people have asked you this, but would you have drank the cyanide? No. And then what do you think would have happened? I would have been killed. Oh, I would have, I would have went down fighting. My sister did. My sister did. For sure, I know that. And, and, and so do you think that, I mean, who, who it, how many people do you think drank? I don't think the majority. I really don't. I think the seniors didn't have a choice. There were seniors that, well, my um, sister's husband's father was there who lived through it, Grover Washington, who passed a few years ago. They thought he was dead. That's the only reason he survived. He was in the senior quarters. And they, you know, they missed him. And they missed Tyson Thrash, who, you know, who, who, who I think she just recently passed or not. but. There were seniors that were missed, so I think that the majority of people did not. I think if you listen to the tapes, and you'll hear the protest. And then I think, too, if you, you know, Jim prepared people also for suicide drills. That was common, you know. When you're, when you're in a place and a man says, okay, we're all going to go in this one cab, we're going to get in here, and we're going to blow ourselves up, this is what, this is what he did. And, and you would do it? I mean, well, I mean, you're looking at him going, there's no way in hell. Everybody's going to die. <laughs> That's what you're thinking. Somebody's going to end up, you know, arms missing, you know, because yeah. you're thinking there's no way you can fit all these people in one cabin. This kind of, this kind of, you know, stuff you would talk about. But on the suicide drills, and I believe there was two, um, peep, some people would drink it. Or he'd ask you, would you drink it? Of course you're going to say, yeah, I'd drink it, Father. You know, because you knew, you knew it wasn't real. You know, he was just testing you. And that's why at the end, I don't think people really knew it was real until they started seeing their loved ones die. And then what would you do? I mean, I look at myself and, and you know, there was, there's eyewitness accounts that said my sister fought like hell. My sister had two babies there. She was not going to allow someone to give her children poison. And they probably shot her because the majority of people, there was a lot of people that were shot. A lot of people. And that, those are things that have not been disclosed. They're in the, let me not say disclosed. There's autopsy reports in the FBI files, Freedom of Information Act. There's files that say that, you know, some, most people were killed, were shot, there were bullet wounds. But you don't ever hear that because it's easier to say all these black folks, you know, unintelligent, um, disillusioned, uh, misfits of society just decide to drink some poison. Let's, let's be us. That's crazy. It's crazy, you know. And even though people, there were some, yes, there were some zealots that could not face the fact that Jim could be what he was, probably say, okay, sure, Father, I'll drink it. But did they know it was real? Probably, probably not. Is that what you had to call him? Father? Mm hmm Oh, yeah, I said that, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Father, yeah. And, and that was mandatory. Oh, yeah, you called him Father. Well, he go from Father to, what was the other one? First, well, first it was Jim. You called him Jim, and then towards the towards the late days in the church, it was Father. You called him Father. That was it. Not Pastor, Reverend, anything like that. It was either Jim or Father. So, 
But let's look at the American public. You have one sixth of the world's population that consumes 92% of the world's hard drugs and call themselves some kind of Christian, God fearing uh, society. There's something wrong, you know, with that picture. Every four seconds we have sit here, 24 hours a day, a woman in America get beat up by her boyfriend or husband. And so there's an insanity that runs through a system like that that's insane enough to believe that they are some kind of God's gift to the world. So we go back and we look at a, at a, at a, at a Jimmy Jones. Uh, and, and first you can't understand Jimmy Jones until you understand where he came from. He came out of Indianapolis, Indiana. And, and the two things he was into was sex and drugs. Now, is it a coincidence that the, the two largest uh, uh, sex and drug systems in the world is located in Indianapolis, Indiana, the Kinsey Report and Eli Lilly? And then when you go all the way back, you trace the first Jewish temple that he had there was financed by Eli Lilly. And then you look at who came out of that. Charlie Manson came out of Indianapolis, Indiana. The Simonese Liberation came out of Indianapolis, Indiana. What are all these groups talking about? Sex and drugs. And so I'm not stupid enough to believe that I can put pieces together in the New York Times can't, or the FBI can't, or the Chicago Tribune can't. That's bullshit. And so when you stop and think about, you know, the unanswered questions is first, who paid for them to get there? That's the, that's the first thing. You know, these aren't little rich children or mothers and fathers or, or live in a stable society. You know, how did they get there? It's just, a, just a, a first simple piece. And why is it a government, as you say, can let it happen, which means it cared nothing about it, but all of them was buried by the government, the government finances. Something, something wrong with that, that picture. And so now let's go back to, to day one. You get a Jimmy Jones that in the early days is financed by Eli Lilly. And then the move to California was financed by Eli Lilly. And then all at once, you know, everything is quiet. And, and then you start having the, the, the state and local governments involved with your children. And then when that have to come up to ask questions about it, then the mayor ends up getting murdered. <laughs> and nobody ties none of that together. 75 years from now, the truth will come out. Maybe before that, we looked at it with Martin Luther King. Um, a little racist redneck cracker fire he, who hated the ground, a nigger walked on that ran the, the, the fire station number two across the street from the Lorraine Hotel, and you add 35 years into his 40, and now you got an old man ready to die, retired, pot belly, got a farm, want to be in the blood of Jesus. So he comes now and he talks to us. And he tells us that that morning a group of white men came by the fire station and identified themselves as government agents, as the military. And they wanted to get up on the, the roof of the fire station to run surveillance on Dr. King. He didn't only let them up, he led them up. What did they have? Well, they had canisters, uh, they had filming equipment. So we know the assassination of Martin Luther King has been filmed and the government owns it. And then he goes on to tell us that uh, uh, there could have been rifles in the canister. Now, why is this important? Because the 111 military intelligence who was there, there are people who have come to us. Now those documents have been released. So there are people that's alive. Uh, that eventually will come. And that's what makes this so important, it makes Reverend Norwood so important, because they have an honest place they can go to and say, hey, this is what, 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 what really happened. I was there. And so even you won't have the documents, you have the person who said they were there. And so this is what makes truth so good and the power of truth, it don't have to be validated by ignorance. 
So when you go back, I, I, I don't know how I got accidentally mixed up in it. I was speaking in Dover, Delaware, a month before Jonestown. I was staying in the, the major hotel. I was at the university. And uh, I go back, and I've been known for years the CIA and the FBI have been wanting to kill me. Matter of fact, we have the documents. And, and so as, as I go back to the hotel, I see all these white men, airline pilots, sitting in the hotel at 11 o'clock at night. frost icing, various kind of uh, cookies. These are filled with crackers back here. And of course, this is the soda pop. Was three cents a bottle by our standards. What's it average now? I suppose about the same. A little more, maybe. Three cents a bottle. Those are quite cheap compared to our standards. Pepsi. It's all manufactured here now. I. Uh, this is a beautiful place here, and you can you can see how all the banana plants and everything are all over the place. They're they're beautiful. And that everybody here is really enjoying here, and I wish I can I can be glad for you guys, everybody over there. They come here in the Promised Land. I really do like it. It's it's fun over here. It's really good. And you, as you can see, we we got a lot of houses built. We're over here, and we're really we're really working hard. Big things on it. It goes up in the air. 